Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Undercooled, materials education podcast. I'm Tim Chambers. I'm here with my host, Steve Yalisov. And today, you do get to hear from somebody who's not us, which will be way better than hearing from us. We have a guest all the way from the far reaches of Western Canada. So Bosco Yu is joining us from the University of Victoria. Glad to have you here, Bosco. Well, nice to thank you so much, uh, Tim and Steve, uh, for, for having me today. Glad to have you. Can we uh, just start off with some introductions? You can tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Maybe you could tell us how you got into material science in the first place and what you're doing in the education space now that you're a professor. Yeah, sure. Uh, so my story about material science and education is a series of very lucky and random events. Um, so I was born in Hong Kong and when I was young, um, I struggled a lot with the traditional educational system. So I, it was in the back in the mid eighties, uh, to early nineties. Uh, and so Hong Kong education system is a lot about, um, uh, spoon feeding. Um, and mm -hmm. Turns out I was actually undiagnosed with a learning disability when I was young. I only know that recently. Um, so I struggled a lot. I was consistently at the bottom of my class in primary to high school. Um, and luckily my parents uh, were nice enough to give me a second chance. So I repeat a few years of high school in Canada. So I went back to, went to Toronto. Uh, and that was really lucky because um, in the Canadian educational system, there's a requirement for extracurricular. And I joined uh, Robotics Club. And so I was uh, one of the students that actually attended the uh, first robotic competition. Our team did terribly, but I didn't <laughs> care. <laughs> um, um, it was the first time that it didn't feel like a failure, even though we didn't do well in the competition. It feel like that we're actually learning something. We're, we're actually scoring points uh, and we're working together with creative uh, uh, design with the robots. And, um, so I started to really like it, engineering, uh, in year two, uh, and embarrassing design for myself actually lead to the role that I joined material science. Uh, so I was designing a roller system for our robot to pick up some basketball at the time. Uh, and guess what? I thought that steel is real. I thought steel is strong. And so I built the entire thing out of steel or designed the entire thing out of steel. Um, we assembled the things together and then the robot is 15% overweight. So last minute, our teacher decided, let's go to Canadian tire and change all the steel axle into just wood shaft. I, I was very skeptical that it would work. I thought it would break, but turns out that it was just stiff and lightweight and it actually works. So that really was the first time that I thought about materials and lead to my education. So I was really interested about learning about material science. So I joined it and I enrolled to both the undergrad and master system in material science and engineering uh, department at U of Toronto. Um, in my undergrad second year, I start to make a life goal. I like learning so much. I want to make it a career. So I decided to try to become a professor one day. And so mm -hmm. subsequently I did my PhD in mechanics of composite in University of Cambridge in UK. I came back from, um, to Canada and I did my postdoc and I started teaching as a teaching professor at my master university in 2020. And, uh, last year I joined <coughs> as an assistant professor in the mechanical engineering department at University of Victoria, uh, in BC. Um, so now at BC, I do 50% um, of research, 50% of teaching. So my research is on sustainable mechanical metal materials. Um, and my university and my student really care about uh, environment. And so uh, when I'm teaching in my teaching term, I teach uh, introduction to material science to our second year engineering, mechanical engineering student. And I also teach a fourth year electives on material selection for sustainable development uh, to the to the student. That is such a great story. One of the things I love about material science as a field and also just as a community is people come to here from so many different places. There's not a single path into material science. It's it's 
a real strength of the field that we have so much diversity of people from different backgrounds because materials touch everything. Steve was a math major. <laughs> I was a physics major. Somehow we ended up here. And, you know, I got to say, I love that story because you talked about robotics, which, of course, is a really hot topic now. And it, um, it kind of struck a, 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 a nice note with me because um, we just started a robotics uh, department in our College of Engineering. And I was on the curriculum committee at the time when they were proposing their new curriculum. And can you believe that in all of their distribution requirements, they weren't requiring their students take material science? And I brought that up. And the head of the program, the guy who started it all, actually said, we don't care about materials. We, we just use aluminum. <laughs> and I, I'm going like, what are you talking about? Don't you understand that you know, materials will allow your robots to be stronger and lighter? to allow your robots to have all sorts of smart functionality built in it. What do you think your sensors are made out of? And he was, even though he's one of the most famous robotics people in the world, he didn't appreciate it. And here you got it as a high school student, understanding how important materials was for robotics. So thank you so much for saying that, Bosco. Well, I learned it the hot way. <laughs> By the well, way, they did, they did now require, they have its part of their uh, distribution that students can take material science. So uh, he, he got it, but it surprised sense. me. As long as we're talking about what our students are learning, not just in a curricular sense, but also in terms of how we motivate them, you know, there's a lot of different approaches to how we can motivate our students. And we want them hopefully to intrinsically value these things <laughs> like oh, I should maybe not just make everything out of steel. Again, such a great story. Um, but there's many different routes to getting students to discover these things. And Bosco, I understand that you do a lot or have done a lot with gamification in some of your courses. So can you tell us a little bit about that and how you apply that concept of gamifying your courses and what it looks like in your classes? Yeah, sure. Um, and I think... Um... We can start just talking about what gamification means because uh, mm -hmm. they, there's some perhaps it's not a, a common terms, uh, especially on education. Um, and everyone know what games means, um, and it's it's supposed to be a fun. Um, it has some kind of rules and it has some kind of mechanics in it. And so um, I believe there's this literature in uh, 2011 uh, from the the Tatting. Um, and they have come up with actually a taxonomy of describing different type of education that involve basically game-like scenario. And so there are actually four different type of game-like scenario. The first one mm -hmm. is game, and everyone know what game is, so I don't need to explain that. Um, but then after that, we actually have three different type of game-like scenario, which is um, serious game, um, gamification, and gameful interact or playful interaction and so gamification is basically a learning um, activity that involves some kind of game element in it where a serious game is actually an educational game but the but the entertainment is not the priority um, and so I try to incorporate both gamification and playful interaction into, into my courses. Um, so the element that involve in gamification are, for example, you might have a reward system. You might pro uh, provide students with scores. Um, there might be levels where students can explore introductory, advanced, etc. cetera. Um, there's a game mechanics. You can also create games such that there is a winning strategy that could be the learning objective. Uh, and then there's playful design, which is like toys, physical demos, storytelling, essentially a, a, a learning environment that are enjoyable. I think the reason I choose this type of um, educational style is that, like you said, we we owe it to the student, in my opinion, to, to make up our engineering education to be more enjoyable, relatable, and memorable. And I think the traditional teaching style forced students to memorize things. 
and it's just not effective. Is there another way to actually perhaps make it more memorable that they don't need to try as hard to memorizing it because it's just not effective. So um, when I was at McMaster University, I tried to uh, develop this kind of game. It was in the middle of the lockdown, so students were learning, uh, entering remotely, and there's, uh, there's only a limited uh, attention span. And they also obviously have device next to themselves that they're going to check if they're bored of class. So uh, one of the things that I was developing is called a material taboo game. So I was teaching introduction to materials um, to general engineering students. And so the students come from high school and they know about physics, they know about chemistry, but they have no, no concept about materials. So this is the first lecture. And if I tell them about crystal and atom, I don't think they will find it that interesting because they can't relate to anything. So I developed a material taboo game, taking the inspiration from taboo. And I have series of balls and they're made out of different materials. And these are common household items like styrofoam, glass, steel. Um, and then I create a game that I ask the entire class um, to, um, to answer questions. And I will ask questions to try to guess the material through a series of questions. And towards the end, the student, so, so the question could be, hey, if I touch that ball, is it, does it feel cold or does it feel warm? And so mm. I use this kind of like touch and feel feeling um, to relate to the student um, so that we can introduce them to material property. And then the progression after that, uh, in the lab environment, we designed, uh, my TA and I designed another game called Material Battleships. And so it is a chart of X and Y axis, and you can put ma different material in there. You can put silver, you can put uh, aluminum and gold in there, and they will have different, let's say, density and stiffness. And so the chart will basically represent that. And two students will compete against each other. They have different material property chart. Um, and so their battleships or the material are in different, different um, location. Um, by the end of that game, um, they can only win if they can guess what is the axis of the other student. Um, and then there's also different levels. And uh, the level one is what we just covered in the lecture, whereas the level two and three are uh, material property that are in, incoming. So uh, the student that are more advanced into the game, they can get, actually try to learn about this new material property uh, before the next lecture. Um, so those are uh, small game or short game. Uh, there's a longer game that uh, we have also designed. So I have uh, taught a course that was on um, mechanical property and design in general. So I want to teach the course about topology optimization, but I don't want to give the solution to the student right away. So what we come up with for the first half of the course is a CAD design challenge uh, that basically mimic the idea of genetic algorithm. So the entire design challenge was kind of like a game where students will submit, um, each group will submit a CAD design of a knee implant. And the objective is to make it um, um, optimized for strength to weight ratio. And so the students submit the CAD design and each week we will iterate, we'll have a, basically a, a ranking board. The top 50th percentile of those CAD design will be slacked and the bottom 50% percentile will be eliminated and then we'll move to the following weeks and the student need to then talk to neighboring team on those top 50 percentiles design and they have to make and create a new inspired uh, cat design based on their parents design and so it's very similar to genetic algorithm and they go through multiple weeks until at the end um, we look at what is the top winning team's design and uh, yeah so it was really enjoyable and uh, Turns out it was only 2% off compared to the topology optimized solution. Yeah. 
So that's fantastic. So, you know, I first have to disclaim here, I'm a huge gamer in my personal life. Like I love board games, video games, role playing games, you name it. And as soon as you talked about Battleship, I'm like, oh my God, that's so true. Anytime you have an X and a Y axis, like you can play Battleship with this, but it can be about physical properties of real things. It doesn't just have to be this sort of arbitrary mathematical grid. So that's, that's super interesting. And with the genetic algorithm aspect, you know, this is another area that I feel is really important that students need to understand how algorithms work, right? It's not just a magical black box that feeds a correct answer. There's a process happening and getting, creating sort of playful ways for students to act out and, and to enact these algorithms for themselves to see how the logic works is really interesting. So I, I think those are both great ideas that I'm thinking about how I might try to fold something similar into my courses. Steve, what's your take? So I actually um, uh, went to Bosco's uh, YouTube channel and I played that taboo game that he was just talking about. And I'll admit it, it took me a while to separate the steel, the stainless steel, the copper and the bronze ball because he didn't give me enough information at first. And it wasn't until he brought up whether it was magnetic or not. And of course, that's cheating because <laughs> I know too much about austenitic stainless steel. <laughs> and it's also not quite fair because a lot of stainless steels are magnetic. It's the austenitic stainless steels that are not. And so, because, uh, you know, I grew up making vacuum chambers and worried about stray magnetic fields for my low energy electron. Uh, diffraction apparatus inside. So we always use 316 stainless steel. But of course, that's much more difficult to machine than, you know, 404 or other ones. But we could always tell right away if it was 316 by just pulling a magnet out. So as soon as he said that, I, I knew what the answer was, even though I know that the um, copper and the bronze wouldn't be magnetic either. It was already clear from the sounds he made. Uh, and then the giveaway was when he told me that it's what kitchen sinks are made out of. Nobody makes kitchen sinks out of brass or copper. You make, you know, Moscow mule glasses for, for uh, copper and brass. But, you know, it was interesting. And I, I guess my problem with gamification it starts with that I'm not a gamer. I can't stand playing games. They are so boring to me. <laughs> I, I really, I don't like them. And I'm afraid that there are, you know, two kinds of people in this world. There are gamers and there are people who aren't <laughs> gamers. And so whenever you try to, um, to use gamification, you're kind of tapping into one culture and ignoring a different culture. And that's something you do need to be careful about. And the other thing that I think is easy to get around, I really liked how Bosco described the different kinds of gaming, his taxonomy. Hopefully you have a link to something like that, Bosco, that yeah, we can sure. include in the show notes so people can uh, tell us. You can give us that later. But um, my big concern about a lot of gamification is that um, it's replacing an extrinsic motivator, winning a game or getting points, uh, from something that I think we are very, very passionate about and believe there is tremendous intrinsic motivation. So our material, you know, we think material science is a beautiful subject. We get very excited when we understand why austenitic stainless steel is not magnetic. You know, that's that's great. You know, mostly it's because it's FCC and not BCC. But then when you start asking yourself, well, why is one magnetic and why is the other not? That's a much deeper question and gets very fascinating. And when you even ask the question of why is something BCC and not FCC? Why at a certain temperature does it change? And that becomes an even deeper question that requires advanced concepts in, um, you know, um, in where the electrons are all hanging out, you know, what, what the orbitals look like. And you need some pretty detailed quantum mechanical calculations to actually figure all that out. So, um, I mean, but man, that stuff gets me so excited. And as soon as I say that, I realize there's another 
bifurcation of culture, those who find it really exciting <laughs> and those who don't. And unfortunately, most people don't find it super exciting. So we're kind of in this quandary of um, how do we present the material? There's what, What's our goal? Is our goal to get our students really excited about material science the way we are? Or is it to give them a framework to use material science to help their careers? And so this is a constant problem. I, I'll never forget, I had a a teacher in high school who was our uh, political science teacher. And um, he used to just say, he goes, look, mass education means mediocre education. You can't escape the fact that if you want to educate the masses, the definition of mediocre is that's what you're going to get. So what do you do? Who do we teach to? So I, you know, I think in there, we, it's good to include some gamification. It's good to make sure we also, I, I think we have to try to teach to every culture within our class. And I think this is very different than learning styles, which have been debunked forever. Um, it's not learning styles. It's really who the person is. And honestly, that becomes a very difficult thing to do, because while you're talking to one culture, you're alienating another culture. And so you end up making all the students hate you. So I don't know. Maybe maybe you can shed some light on this. Well, yeah, that's that's a good point that I do want to ask Bosco about is what do you see on the student side as you're implementing these different ideas? How is it working? Who's being engaged and who isn't resonating with it and how do you try to keep the whole class inclusive in that way yeah so i can uh bring up uh another thing that i do in lecture so i do want to mention that um steve bring up a very good point and i don't think that gamification should be unilaterally being implemented on everything in uh education i think that the ultimate goal that i see is that Education should be memorable, relatable, so that students care about why those topics are interesting. I think material science is freaking cool. And so I want to communicate mm -hmm. to the student that it is freaking cool. And so I need to make them excited about that. Um, it is much harder to advertise about material science than physics because they already know about physics in high school. Um, and so one thing I want to comment about is that um, Professor do need to know about the uh, general culture uh, of their particular class. And it's really hard to know, to be honest. But um, once you get an idea what are the student behavior, you can kind of try to tailor to your education style towards that. And gamification is not the only way to, to achieve um, uh, being memorable. There is active learning, there is experiential learning, there's project-based learning. They are equally legit, and I do use that in uh, my, my upper year elective as well. Um, but then I do want to mention there's another one that is, I think, more universal, and it's just simply playful interaction. Uh, I could give you a couple of examples of what I've done uh, in my uh, fourth year elective. So, for example, in my material selection class, I was introducing students uh, to material selection. Um, so instead of just talking about how, let's say, a quark, wine, wine quark school works, um, and what kind of material is best for it, I decided to talk about something I'm really passionate about. I, I like biking. I have five different bikes, and they're made of different materials. And then I will role, I will role play and dress like a road biker and bring out my road bike, which is made of carbon, and then bring my commuter bike, which is made out of uh, tensile steel, and then show them the show them the weight, show them the course, um, and then also show them the two dimension to talk about how these uh, material property are uh, embedded into the selection process as well as in the manufacturing process. And I think that playful interaction is really important because students think that you care um, and they can see your passion and and it's just relatable because this is everyday example, right? 
I also tried to role play as a detective Conan um, and talk about uh, a forensic inv investigation of Titanic disaster and look into the forensics report and talk about how the Titanic steel was inferior compared to the modern steel. Um, and then this is a, another one. I, I really enjoy cooking. So I, um, I baked pizza in the lecture and it was baked on top of two pieces of material. Um, and the lecture learning objective is on thermal conductivity. I can teach thermal conductivity very efficiently and very boringly, or I can teach that after I show them how two different pieces on two different surfaces, one is stone, one is steel, and which one look more crispy, which one looks nicer. Uh, and so I think that playful interaction is kind of like just universally useful for, for many style of education. Um, and then as for student, um, I think the student really enjoyed it. Like we look at some uh, simple survey after looking into our lab material. So the game design that we created, um, the student uh, agreed that is uh, supporting the learning outcome. Um, it increased the motivation, which is one thing that I'm really interested. Uh, and then another thing, I think material science is broadening a lot lately. There are a lot more topic to cover. So one thing that I want to make sure is that students stay interested about learning more about material science, even after my class and perhaps even after they graduate. And so another thing that I measure is their in general interest into material science and generally they are increasing. Um, we also check about uh, the lecture, so uh, the attendance. So one thing that I try not to do, uh, I, I never done that, uh, is to provide grades to attendance. I believe that students, if they want to learn, they should, they, if they think the lecture is valuable, um, they should come to the lecture. And if they think that the textbook is more useful, then, then I'm not doing my job. And so uh, we measure that and we find that uh, the attendance is at very high level and uh, the students uh, have increased interest in content after that. So yeah, um, I don't recommend doing gamification on everything and also don't recommend everyone to do gamification because kind of you need to be a gamer in the first place. Um, but yeah, it, it seems to be working. That's great. I I, um, I love your pizza example. And of course, I follow the work of Nathan Mervgold, who was the first person to actually talk about that in Modernist Kitchen. I don't know if you know who he is. He was a uh, he was a physics PhD student. He was a postdoc with Stephen Hawking, and he developed some bit of code that this guy in the United States named Bill Gates thought was critical to his new operating system and bought the company. And he became, Nathan Mervgold became one of the original owners, founders of Microsoft. But his passions besides physics were cooking and photography. And so after he made his billions, he quit the company and he started out in the out, out near you in the Pacific Northwest, this company, mm -hmm. the Modernist Cuisine, and hired all these scientists to do food science. And one of the things he did was look at why steel is much better, because not only does it have a great heat capacity like the stone, but the thermal conductivity is way higher than stone. And so you need to get that heat into the rising crust quickly to get the big bubbles and the crispy texture. So that's that's great. How do you actually do that, though? We're not allowed to bring propane or wood fires into our uh, <laughs> lecture halls. How do you do that? Oh, it was a lot of research and figure out health and safety. Uh, and we end up using a mini oven. And it wasn't actually pizza. It ended up, I have to go into different supermarket and try different dough and end up uh, using empanada, a frozen empanada for, for it to work. Um, yeah, research. <laughs> That's great. That's fantastic. I do bring food examples into class all the time. Partly I'm very food motivated, but also there is so much science in cooking and so much material science in it. And just the other day, a friend was asking me, why whiskey stones are so bad and why they don't actually cool your drinks. And 
I had to talk about latent heat, you know? Well, yeah, it's, it's not the heat capacity of the ice that matters. It's all the energy that gets sucked up into melting the ice is how you're actually cooling your drink. And yeah, these examples are just everywhere. Um, you know, as long as we're talking about engagement and just getting people excited, uh, I think that's a good chance to move on to our other topic for today, which is bringing the public into material science and getting people to appreciate and be excited about our field and to know that it exists for that matter. You know, MSE has this awareness problem where the public kind of doesn't know that we exist and students come to college not knowing they can major in materials. So one area that we're seeing a lot of growth in lately is in online free video education on social media, you know, on YouTube, on TikTok, and content creators doing really interesting and sometimes really high quality science education for free for the public on these platforms just to get people excited about science. So um, Bosco, as Steve said earlier, you have a YouTube channel. I know you and I have had some separate conversations about what teaching on YouTube looks like. So as we're thinking about how can the materials community represent the materials community on social media and on social video and get people excited and learning, what do you think are some strategies that we could use as a community that maybe we're not implementing yet? That's a very good question. So first of all, I want to clarify that I'm not a, I'm not actually a YouTuber. I, I post a couple of <laughs> YouTube videos, so I don't want to, I don't want to misinform anyone. Um, but I am quite interested about YouTube uh, platform in general, uh, especially education in, in YouTube. Um, and I think it is there's a lot of potential that we can uh, promote material science education uh, uh, in other social media in general. Um, and there are success story in, in many university already, um, just not in material science. So to give you a couple of examples, University of Nottingham, I believe they have a physics department and they develop, they, they have a YouTube channel called 60 Symbol and they often interview professor on interesting topics. And so it has an accumulator of all these interesting uh, uh, video that, that, that you can watch about physics. There's also a number of fields, which I believe is, is interviewing a lot of uh, uh, professor from the math department um, and I think why social media is working is just, it is a entertainment platform, uh, in general, a lot of the content student are absorbing right now is for entertainment value, but there are few YouTuber really just get the right interjunction between education and, um, entertainment. So you're basically making education fun. The algorithm has to make the audience engage, and that's basically the job requirement. So these YouTubers are basically an expert in uh, audience engagement. Um, another thing is also YouTuber, YouTuber uh, create this kind of demo or create this kind of video. It has to be fun to watch, and they often use physical demo, and they have limited budget. And so they need to come up with very creative way to create this content. And so me as a professor, not just talking about um, promoting material science in general, I sometimes actually go to YouTube and look at ideas. Uh, I, I want to create this lab activity and I can't, I can't scale it up to 150 students. I need to find a way to be economical. I'm going to create a demo or lab activity that is cheap enough to do that. I look into YouTube and there, there are already many YouTube video that is available. It's about material science. Um, I can name a few of this. Smarter Every Day that does tempered glass. Manatesium mm -hmm. that does uh, transistor and paste electric effect. V6 Girl on polarizing glass. Um, Steve Moe on crystal oscillator. And then Breaking Dip even built his own scanning laser microscope. So these are all very material science related content but it's kind of embedded in the general umbrella of science, STEM, or, 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 or physics uh, uh, name. I think it would be cool if we can collaborate with these um, um, uh, educator in YouTube and in social media and, and, and work on video together that um, 
that are stating out that it is material science related. Um, and I think that in terms of promotion, um, I see that there are a few universities already starting to do something related to ma material, mostly metrology though. So University of Utah have an uh, Instagram uh, channel, uh, it's called Metrology with Marina, and they dive deep into element by element and talk about the historical perspective of those elements to ex engage the, this, the newer generation. Um, uh, IIT actually have another channel called Metrology Engineering, sorry, Metrological Engineering, and they run annual micrograph uh, competition. And so any scientist can send uh, electron micrograph to them and, um, and, and be ranked. Um, our student, uh, my, my previous university, uh, at my master university, our student also uh, create reel on uh, TikTok. And they promote not just the material science aspect, but also the student life. And so they have what is called the day in the life uh, video, where the student will um, go through, usually grad student, and go through the whole day of what are they doing uh, in the morning. They may be uh, doing research in the evening, they're doing classes. Uh, they also check out co-op student, what is their experience in the industry. And um, at the University of Victoria, we actually tried something really I thought it's just a, a, a for, for, for fun, um, but turns out there are a lot of um, uh, engagement. Um, we recreate a soap bubble raft experiment from uh, Lawrence Brack and John Snyde, 1947 experiment called the soap bubble raft, where you're looking at each of the soap bubble and it can show you uh, crystal crystal. Uh, defects such as dislocation and grain boundary and when you move it this location will move like a dislocation slip um, and we posted on LinkedIn and for some random reason we got like 200,000 view on that video thinking that apparently we oh, wow. something. yeah the, 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 the cool thing is we did not invent anything we just basically read the paper <laughs> and we recreated that and some people thought it was created by us and we have to clarify that um, but what I'm getting here is that the potential are there, that there are a lot of cool experiment demo that we have accumulated in, in, in the field that people don't know about. We just need to put it in a central platform. And the challenge, I would say, is uh, getting the university resource and support to, to help with that. I wonder if that wouldn't be a good thing for, say, TMS Education Committee to get involved with, to try to start collecting that. I know for years when I was at the Materials Research Society, before they dissolved their Academic Affairs Committee, uh, that was going to be one of our main uh, uh, topics because we all need to use these demos in our class. We can also use all these demos for the general education. So maybe we need to have one of our societies step up create a channel, put some money behind it, provide awards for who creates the best uh, demo project and posts it, maybe have a group of people who vets it to make sure that the quality is up to par. And because uh, I, I totally agree with you, we need this resource desperately. And um, we're all doing this independently. What a waste of effort. We're all reinventing the wheel. And we don't always all do it as well as some of our colleagues do at other places. We all have access to different kinds of equipment, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, that's a great idea, Bosco. Yeah, you know, the, the thought about getting this done more at the professional society level is really interesting because even a single university, you know, at Michigan, we have our way of doing things. Victoria, you have your way of doing things. Utah has their way of doing things. And if it's something that we have to get together and agree on and say, this is good to represent all of us, then I think that would go a long way toward the sort of quality control aspect that Steve was mentioning, but also just be a good way to incentivize us to share more with each other between our different institutions and break down those barriers a little bit. You know, um, I, I tried for a while to create a open source textbook, but I think that what makes that very, very difficult 
is we're fighting the new way that students really want to learn, which is by watching short videos. I mean, it's no surprise that the biggest part of YouTube that is taking off like crazy is the YouTube shorts, which must be one minute or less because people don't have long attention spans. And I think if we could learn how to master that format in a way that is retrievable, allows people to organize things, to build a curriculum on that, uh, maybe even engaging our students to help us and doing it internationally with all of us being involved, maybe that's a better way to create an open source textbook. Steve, you're putting a lot of pressure on me because every semester the students say to me, Tim, you should really start a TikTok channel. And I'm like, oh, that's for young people. But <laughs> there's... Well, turn, turn it around. Have the students make an assignment. That's right. Where the students have to create the TikToks for you and the good ones get posted. Mm. Because there's... there will be a lot of bad ones. Sure. <laughs> there is a great challenge in being able to communicate something effectively and correctly in only a minute like look at us we're 45 minutes into this episode and we still have plenty more things that we could talk about but that one minute constraint is actually really valuable from a pedagogical point of view as well so i think that would be great to to get our students engaged with as well as ourselves well before you sign us off tim i just wanted to thank bosco so much for coming on with us. We're way over time, as you pointed out, Tim. So thank you, Bosco. This has been great. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. I do want to make sure before we close it out for today um, to do our, our official last question, which is, do you have anything you want to tell the audience about? Any do you want to <laughs> promote your YouTube channel, maybe get motivated <laughs> to throw a few more videos on there, start some shorts or any other just things that you're working on that you think would be interesting to share? Yeah, um, I guess the one thing that I'm working on right now is uh, in collaboration with ANSYS and my colleagues um, on uh, Dr. Dr. Joe Lagos uh, from Cal Poly. Uh, so we recently hired a co-op student and we are designing something that I think both you and Steve will like. We're creating a marble games for teaching material science to grade 12 students. Um, and so uh, this game is going to be very textile. All those material is supposed to be, you can just touch and feel, and we're going to talk about material property in it. Um, and we're just going to make this uh, audience to like know the differences between one material versus the other in a very playful manner. Uh, we're going to present the prototype in the North America um, Material Educational Symposium. Um, we're still trying to figure out the course and IP at this point, um, but the goal is to make this uh, available to other universities so that as a community, you can have this board game and promo material science in outreach events and university fair. Um, so keep an eye out. Uh, I, I think it will be fun. That sounds great. I look forward to playing with the beta version at the Materials Education Symposium coming up this summer. Okay, well, I guess we should wrap it up. My clock is yelling at me to shut up already. So, um, Bosco, thank you again so much for making the time to come be with us to share your ideas and your insights about teaching material science and engineering. And I suppose that's it for now to to you to Steve to our audience uh, we're recording this on December 30th so happy new year to everyone and I guess we'll see you next year on the next episode of Undercooled. Cool.